to Scary Basement. Each week, me and my friend Roxy are drawn inexplicably and supernaturally to this basement, wherein lurks every scary thing that has ever been, including a serial killer who cannot be killed through traditional means, a rat with an Instagram following, a painting whose eyes follow you all around the house, even to the bathroom, and a clump of creatures from the Black Lagoons that got their fins all tied together and became a creature from the Black Lagoon King. I am Mikey McCaller. And I'm Roxy Polk. <laughs> Roxy, let's start out, as we always do, with the scariest thing that happened to you this week. What went down in your life outside the scary basement that spooked you to your bones? So this was something I was reminded about. I didn't learn of it the first time, but I was reminded of it this week. And uh, <laughs> the concept of it alone is quite frightening. Uh, do oh. you know about Victorian death photos, Mikey? No. You don't. Okay. So they're like no. old black and white creepy photos that are literally like dead people dressed up and posed in chairs and having their <laughs> photos taken. Creepy. Which a lot of ways, the, the real reason for why they did this is quite like heartbreaking and sad, but like viewing it through a modern lens and just thinking about the logistics of it is like very just a kind of a unsettling. Yeah. Because photos didn't really exist at the time, and if they did, they were really expensive. So, like, it wouldn't be an ordinary thing a person would get. It was, like, a huge expenditure to get it. So, for some people, it's like, well, this important person died to me. I want to be able to remember them. So, there was a whole mm -hmm. industry around death photos with people getting their dead relatives and loved ones immortalized on film. And then that's, like, the only record of them that exists in picture form is these photos of them after they're dead. And what, what do they look like? Are they posing them in some way? Are they, like, painting eyes on their eyelids? W what's going on? Um, their eyes would be closed, uh, but they'd be, like, propped up sitting in a chair with, like, their hands folded or something. <laughs> they, they have been weakened at Bernie's. Yes, basically, yeah. They... <laughs> That's this was the inspiration for Weekend at Bernie's. I don't know if you <laughs> they put little that. sunglasses on them and a corn cob pipe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> move their arms around and stuff to look like they're uh, dancing at the party or whatnot. <laughs> that's very scary. And so yeah, that's the thing that scared me this week. How about you, Mikey? What scared you this week? Roxy, I've been playing the new uh, PlayStation Five video game Stray, <gasps> where you play as a little cat boy. Cat, so cute. I need it's to a great play this game. It's a solid cat game. You play as a cat. It feels like a cat. It's an incredible achievement vis-a-vis -vis transporting you into the mind of a cat. Yes. How could you ever want anything else? There is a room halfway through this game that okay. I got to that was too scary to be in a video game. And that's slowly becoming my new phrase. When something okay. is too scary to even be allowed in a media, <laughs> it's too scary to be in a video game. Some scenes, such as everything that happened in The Exorcist, are too scary to be in a movie. It's just too much. It's too much for a person to handle. This scene in Stray, Roxy, you're a little cat. You go underground. You're in the sewers. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of gunk on the wall. All of a sudden, okay. that gunk opens its eye. <laughs> what? Okay. Is it... So it looks like just a wall painting or something? Or do... It looks It looks like uh, somebody... A like crime? Almost like a tumor has been growing on the wall. And oh. then it opens like um this will be a resident evil reference for all the resident evil heads like william birkin's shoulder eye there's like this famous okay. resident evil monster who just has this big hulking shoulder and it opens up and there's a big eye and it happens in stray and it's too much it was too much for me it hit my giant's fear it hit my mm -hmm. eyeballs fear it hit my i'm a little cat and there's nothing i can do fear it was very scary and it should have been canceled they should have cut it from the game to save me and so did you run really fast because you're a cat and it's a I grime did. monster stuck on the wall that's okay. yeah, That's exactly what I did, and I think that's what the game wanted me to do. <laughs> did it ever show there. up again? Did it, like, chase you, or is it just, like, here's a spooky thing that just occurred? It it has a built-in narrative reason for why okay. it's happening, and it's pretty smart and good. I think the story is, like, very... It's a solid base hit of a story. Uh, okay. Very scary, and it plays out well, and that, I think, is the highlight of the game, just in terms of being very scary. But also, again, I do not think it should have been allowed to be in a video game. Especially because that game is not a horror game, so yeah. that's like a very <laughs> spooky a thing to happen in a game that you would not be prepared for it to be horror. Like, it's different if you're getting into a Resident Evil game, and then, yeah, Birkin's Eye opens. It's like, yeah, that's horrific. This is a horror game. Like, that tracks. Mm -hmm. But a cute little cat simulator in sci-fi future world, that is not something I would expect you to see. just be eating beef jerky and hanging out with your friends in cat game. And speaking, Roxy, of hanging out with your friends, here comes the Demon Bot. 
Mikey and Roxy, this week you were assigned the 1984 film Children of the Corn. Did you watch the film or your souls forfeit? Yes, yes, I watched the movie. I watched Children of the Corn. Great, I also watched Children of the Corn. Good, then you may keep your souls. For now. There he goes. Crawled into a small hole in the floor. <laughs> Roxy, did you uh, know the demon bot could shrink like that? I did not know that. He's, uh, how many secret abilities is he keeping hidden from us? And how many do we need to be worrying about? I fear the answer is infinite. Probably. Roxy, we did, in fact, watch Children of the Corn. For anybody who mm -hmm. hasn't seen the movie and may be listening up at the basement door. What do you say we do a quick plot recap? That sounds amazing. Let's do it. We open in Gatlin, Nebraska, where a little boy named Joby is the only child in the town to go to church. Afterwards, he and his father stop off at the soda shop to call and check in on Joby's sick little sister, Sarah, and to get a milkshake. In that moment, the town's children murder every adult in the town under direction from a creepy little 12-year-old named Isaac. Just stabbing and chucking and... Shucking Poison. is a thing that they use with uh, corn, right? <laughs> with corn, yes. Uh, not so much with people, but you can imagine what that would mean when put into the context of murdering someone. At the same time, Sarah, back home, starts drawing visions of the future. That's right. Two weird things happen at once. Uh, we meet a young couple, Vicky and Bert, who are driving through the country. So Bert can start a new internship and indeed a new life altogether. Simultaneously, one of the little boys trapped in the adult-free Isaac cult tries to escape, only to be murdered by Isaac's number one 13-year-old heavyweight, Malachi. Now, after this little boy gets his throat slit, he then wanders into the street, where Bert and Vicky drive right over him. Just screed into this little boy. It's very funny. I had to rewind it to, like, see, <laughs> is this a dummy? Is this a mannequin? What did they do here? <laughs> Stopping the car to go look at the little boy he just plowed into, an unsettlingly nonchalant Bert puts the little boy's body in his trunk, where, spoiler, it will remain for the rest of the movie and, one can only assume, the rest of eternity. Truly. Looking for a phone to call the police? To incriminate themselves, maybe? Bert and Vicky stop at a mechanic shop. The old man who's there is a creepy harbinger, if there ever was one. And he sends them away, telling them there is no town called Gatlin, even though every street sign says Gatlin is a mere three miles away. We then see Isaac, a little boy with, who talks like a full-blown adult, speaking to his crew of murderous children. He tells them of a man or creature called He Who Walks Behind the Rose, before sending Malachi to remind the mechanic not to tell the outlanders, Bert and Vicky, where the children are. As Bert and Vicky drive around like yutzes, Malachi kills the old Harbinger's dog, which is very sad because it was a cute dog, and then he kills the Harbinger himself. It's around here that Bert and Vicky decide to go to Gatlin anyhow and drive off through the cornfield. When they reach Gatlin, Bert and Vicky explore the seemingly abandoned town before stumbling into a house where Sarah, the little girl with future vision, sits drawing her little future drawings. Bert and Vicky ask Sarah where all the adults are, and all she can muster is some feeble, Isaac, Malachi. I don't know why I'm making fun of her. She's a little, a little girl. She did her best. Her family's been murdered, you know. <laughs> very, very good Get target. it together. You're a public speaker, Sarah. <laughs> Bert then goes off to look for a phone to call the police and, again, report the child that he still has in his trunk while Vicky stays with Sarah. Bert soon stumbles upon a blood ritual being done by some children in the church, and he fights them and gives them one of many out-of-nowhere speeches about the true nature of religion, before one of the children stabs him in the chest, and he uh, just pulls out the knife and flees. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sarah draws Vicky a future drawing that Vicky finds either disturbing or unflattering, we aren't told which. <laughs> It's then that the Malachi-led children slayers enter the house and abduct Vicky, just like Sarah's drawing said they would. It's very funny. Sarah, like, gives Vicky the drawing, and Vicky just looks at it and turns up her nose. <laughs> and then <laughs> She's like, what? We, know, we don't see the drawing until the end of the scene, so we don't know if it's just a bad drawing <laughs> or yeah. what's going on. My eyes are over here, not, like, two little dots askew the way you drew it <laughs> yeah can i show you uh you start you want to start with the base figure you start with a big circle and then you do these kind of grid lines the eyes will connect with the nose etc 
Back in the cornfield, Isaac is pissed that Malachi killed the old harbinger, and Malachi decides to take the reins of the child cult himself. He orders Isaac be murdered instead of Vicky. So the one-time little boy leader is strung up on a corn cross just across from the skeletal remains of a policeman, presumably the last adult to ever oppose these corn children. Isaac's cries that his own death will not please he who walks beyond the rose go unheard. Bert returns to Joby, who helps him form a plan to save Vicky, which is basically just go to the cornfield and rescue Vicky. He's really <laughs> great at planning things, Bert. Uh, while Isaac is being sacrificed, in quotation marks, Bert makes his move and gets Vicky free from the children's clutches, because he is a big adult who can just push around small children. <laughs> it's a lot easier than you'd think. Then, the man who still has a dead child in his trunk proceeds to give a speech on the importance of love, while an otherworldly red light sucks up Isaac, who is trapped on that corn cross. Finally, Bert and the children realize they have to fight back against he who walks behind the rose and devise a big scheme to pump the cornfields full of gasoline and burn it all down. The plan works. He who walks behind the rose, who is just like an energy entity? We don't see it super clearly, do we? No. Anyhow, he who walks beyond the rose explodes into a very big explosion that we get from four or five different camera angles. And finally, Bert and Vicky decide to take Joby and Sarah home to live with them. But for no more than a month. Like, <laughs> our man makes it clear as, like, maybe a month they can stay with you us. You just live with us for a little bit. <laughs> then you'll be orphans. Yeah, yeah. You get a, a one month pass, and then it's off to the poorhouse with you. Whatever happens, happens. <laughs> Joby and Sarah laugh when they hear that they only have a very short time to be with the only people who have ever taken care of them. Then another little girl jumps out of the backseat and tries to children of the corn old <laughs> bird. Which, uh, by that, he means murder. <laughs> she is unsuccessful, and Bert, Vicky, Joby, and Sarah all walk the 19 miles to the next town over, leaving that car with the trunk of the dead boy there forever. <laughs> the car just stays. Yep. What a movie. That's Children of the Corn, folks. That sure is Children of the Corn. Mm. This is a weird one, Rox. This was a... a, a... <laughs> right on the line between, like, a struggle and a joy. Because it is funny and weird. Yeah, it also feels so budget and, like, made for TV. Mm. What what was it? 80... What was the release here on this? 82, I want to say? Yeah. And it's, like, before What's-Her-Face with Sarah Connor in Terminator. So, like, seeing her... Linda yes. Hamilton, that's it. Uh, seeing Vicky her this... is played by Linda Hamilton, and yeah. she's pretty good, right? Like, as good as she can be, like, she does a fine job, but, like, what her character is given to do is just being so inept and kind of useless, <laughs> which was such, like, if it was before she did Terminator, then sure, but, like, if it's after she did Terminator, like, what a waste to have, like, an action <laughs> girl reduced to what Vicky does in this movie, which is just kind of sit around with these kids and fall asleep in a car and almost get stabbed or get stabbed in a dream or something. That's <laughs> Put up a on great a cross point. And scream. <laughs> Roxy, would you believe these two movies, The Terminator and Children of the Corn, came out in the same year? The same year? That's insanity. Mm -hmm. 1984. Damn. Especially because, like, Bert is so lame as, like, an action hero. It makes no sense. There's a part where, like, he finally kind of pushes down Malachi, who's been chasing him all over town. And he literally just kind of, like, hits him, and then he turns around and walks into a pillar. And I was like, yep. what? They kept that in? Is that supposed to be real? He's like, oh, 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 God. He acts more hurt from that than getting stabbed in the literal right side of his chest, which would have, like, collapsed a lung or punctured a lung or something. But he's just fine. He runs at full speed out of the church and runs all over town after getting stabbed in the lung. I will say that this movie has so very, very much indescribable decisions being made mm -hmm. by the characters. Like, it makes me really appreciate Listen, to be clear— it is a very scary concept that the children can take over a town. Like, that's a yeah. cool concept that's very frightening. They've all got, they've got like their iconic weapons. The, uh, again, I feel like you shuck a corn. I don't know. They've got this iconic like hook that's on like the movie poster. Like the, the scythe? The scythe. Yes, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. The children of the corn are very cool. This movie is incoherent. Like, these characters are making yeah. decisions that like don't make sense. There's, okay, I want to describe a scene. Okay. That, infuriated me <laughs> one of many i'm sure bert and vicky have just stopped at the old harbingers gasoline emporium okay and he's like i don't have any gas you'll have to go to the next town they're like okay gatlin got it and then he's like no gatlin isn't real 
The next town is 19 miles over. They're like, okay, great. And so they drive up and they see a sign that says Gatlin, three miles, whatever the next town, 19 miles. I was like, oh, well, I'll bet they'll just say, and this is an easy screenwriting thing. It's just like, this old guy's an idiot. Like, let's just go to Gatlin. It's three miles. I don't even know if we'll make it 19 miles. Go do it. They do not do that. They try to go 19 miles. It doesn't take them anywhere. They drive through a cornfield and end up back at the guy's place. And then they're like, and then they say, after this long, pointless road circle, then they say exactly what I wanted them to say two scenes earlier. Well, Gatlin's closer. There are signs pointing us towards it. Let's just go there. Like, just do that first. Just do that first, fellas. Yeah, it it made no sense. That entire scene, too, like, I feel like I would have to rewatch it. But I do remember it making no sense. Like, they'd say they'd be turning to it, and then it would still have the same mile marker to be like, oh, it's still 19 miles away, or, oh, Gatlin is still three miles away, even though they've driven a lot. <laughs> right. So I could not be sure if it was because, one, the he who walks beyond the rose or something is supernatural, so he, like, wants to keep them there, so he's bending things to keep them there. If it is... That's never explained, showed, or even inferred. So poor, poor execution on that. Two, if the children don't want adults bothering them, why would they keep up any road signs? You'd think it would be number one priority to just take down all the signs for Gatlin. But they're still up there. So Paint then it confuses them. it even more. And then I don't even understand, like, how they got onto the cornfield. The cornfield is not a road. So I don't understand... I remember looking away to, like, look at my phone and looking back up, and I was like, why are they in a, driving in a cornfield at, like, top speed? What the fuck is happening? You ever driven through a cornfield at top speed, Roxy? Uh, not, not yet. I gotta add it to my bucket list now, though, seeing how much fun <laughs> these characters had doing it. And then, yeah, they just end up back at the the uh, gas station place for and this, some reason. To be clear, so. this is after they've murdered a child. I want to be very, very Man clear. slaughtered a child. But yes. <laughs> well, I would argue his actions afterwards. Well, I, I guess murder is premeditated. It's <laughs> certainly way worse. It's a cover up. They are driving and they're looking at the map and not paying attention to the road. And then they hit a little boy and then... Mm -hmm stop and get out and check on him and he gets out and he's like that little boy's throat was already cut and they're like whew i wasn't responsible it's like your actions were still not watching the road when a child ran out <laughs> like you yeah, still you murdered still a child him. <laughs> made <laughs> him die quicker me. or made him die in more pain than he would have initially so uh definitely guilty of that roxy it reminds me of the movie never been kissed where the journalist has uh, gone into high school and she's like pretending to be a high schooler and her teacher hits on her and then uh -huh. at the end they're like oh it's okay because she was an adult all the time <laughs> and it's like no based on what he knew his actions were abhorrent and it's the same yeah, thing with this, she was a teen Fucked this up. running into a child <laughs> it was like you still committed a horrible atrocity. It's just like, ooh, thank God his throat was already slit. It just feels like, okay, great. Now my life doesn't have to be over because I accidentally murdered a little kid. Yeah, like they wanted to make you feel better about the characters and be like, oh yeah, they're not actually child murderers. You're supposed to like them. So don't worry about this audience whose neck was cut beforehand. <laughs> so he was already dead when they hit him, even though he I could also walk thought out it been, there. It would have been very funny if- that was a child, uh, it wouldn't be anymore. I thought that when uh, Lyndall Hamilton as Vicky goes over to check on Bert, who is looking at the corpse of the boy, mm -hmm. if she was like, I don't think his throat is cut. And he's like, no, it's cut. Trust me. Trust me. Get back in the car. No, it's it's cut. Believe me. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> It'd be so funny. To also, if his throat is cut, why is he walking around? Uh, I mean, that's what he goes to find out. That's why Bert sees fresh blood on like the corn leaves and finds his bag and then takes his bag back with him and then he's like obsessed to be like well go through his bag go through that dead child's bag and linda hamilton's <laughs> like no that's kind of like fucked up like we killed him and it's his thing that he owns shouldn't we give it to his family or something i want to see if he and has a like, game boy yeah he's like no i think there's a clue in there which i mean <laughs> sure that's that's fair i guess to be like well somebody did kill him and that's bad so maybe there will be something about it there. But, like, he's so pushy and rude about it. Like, Bert is extremely <laughs> unlikable in the movie. I don't think he's a likable character at all. He doesn't do a single likable thing. Can you think of any you less likable characters in a movie? I guess, like, at least Vicky is, like, kind to little girl Sarah. Yeah. Until she draws her a, a drawing that displeases her. 
Well, you but can Bert... also tell, like, with their relationship, too, she's trying. Like, she's really happy about his internship and new job and new life thing, even though it means he's going to, like, be moving away from her, I think, or mm-hmm. something. So there's some underlying tension there, but she's, like, trying her best to celebrate. She sings that stupid song for too long when they wake up in the hotel Roxy, room. here's a question for you. Uh-huh. In the opening scene, when f- it's Bert's birthday, right? Yes, yes. Is it his birthday or it's like he, the celebration for his job? Because the song that she sings is about how like, you're done with school. You don't have to be in school anymore. Or like the lines from it. No, it's it's his birthday. She jumps it's out. His she, birthday. That's she even like even more sh- weird. This is all taking place on Bert's birthday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I totally forgot about that. Okay. Uh, but I did write down why is his birthday serenade about how school's out. So it's like, why is it also that? But it's the first jump scare of the movie. She like jump scares yeah. and goes like, "Happy birthday," and it's mean. Maybe it's not. Now I'm thinking about it. Well, because I can't remember how scared he was. It like scares the audience, but he's like not barely awake. Yeah, he makes a wish. He makes a wish in that first scene. Yeah, he, she because he like blows up. The... She brings him like a little cupcake. Yeah, with, and he blows yeah, up the candle. candle, and she's like, "What's your wish?" And he won't tell her. Oh, to ha- to live happily ever after. And she's like, "Is that a proposal?" So and immediately in the very beginning of this movie, I'm like, "Oh, this movie is going to be about this man's journey to commitment to a, to decide yeah, I want like to commit she, to this woman." Yeah, she seems to be really in love with him. It seems to be more like he's holding back. Like when they hit the kid, she's extremely emotionally distraught, and he's just kind of whatever about it. Mm-hmm. Which, if he's a doctor or something, like sure, I can buy that. And maybe if it's like she's freaking out so he needs to be more of like the pillar sure but it also mm-hmm. just kind of i'm not sure if it's the actor like his face or his expression it just looks like there's nothing going on back there right. when that scene is happening he's just I, apologies to the guy i'm sure in real life he's a lovely person but like his on-screen presence for this movie he has like no charisma whatsoever no he uh, that actor famously said i think more children should do the children of the corn <laughs> so not a great guy emotions <laughs> aren't real <laughs> I don't think that's true. Roxy, I've got a big question for you. And it's something okay. I was thinking about throughout this entire movie. Uh-huh. Is the concept of the children of the corn more or less scary if there is nothing supernatural here going on? Um, I'd say it's more scary, honestly. More scary if there's nothing supernatural going on? Yeah, because if there's a supernatural thing, you can point to that and be like, oh yeah, that's a demon causing that, not just human nature gone awry. That That's a possibility for to happen to any child theoretically if given the right <laughs> set of uh prompts for whatever happened in their life roxy i hate to spring this on you i set a trap welcome to exactly the reason i hate stephen king oh it's so lame that everything is always <laughs> the ultimate battle between good and evil and a demon has come to earth and it uh, is like it's so much scarier if there are little kids who have gotten swayed by some other little fucked up kid to murder all their children friends or I'm sorry murder all the adults in the town and then go on and start a little cult the yeah. fact that he who walks behind the rose is real mm-hmm. sucks that was such a letdown and it came pretty quickly i feel like i don't remember how but like i guess not until they strung up isaac yeah, and they he didn't got consumed show... by red lightning. So this was a thing about the adaptation like in the adaptation you you don't see the creature at all. In the original thing, it's like some sort of like beast monster thing. But in this movie, you just see like dirt, something under the dirt moving. Yeah. Um, you never see an actual monster. And then when it dies, there's a plume of smoke and a weird like giant evil face that is superimposed onto the smoke cloud from the explosion to be like, that's the face of the monster. Very spooky. But it's This not. movie is so, <laughs> so much better without... And it's also... This is the other Stephen King trope I hate. The, like, there's simultaneously when the great evil appears, the great good appears. There's a person who can see the future or there's a person who's been chosen to be the great good and we've got to do these great big good versus evil, which is not how real life works. Like, we don't fight <laughs> ultimately well, evil things we fight human beings who have different opposing views to us yeah the idea it's also of, just very simplistic like that there's gonna yeah. always be one good and one evil thing like that like yeah there's no in between like how did that get there it's just evil don't worry about it freaking childish he's a child i hate also this this is like a 20 page story originally so it's not even like a book so they're adapting something much smaller but hmm. 
the movie kept out some of the worst things about it too. Ooh, which I don't know. Hit if me you... with the deep lore, Roxy. I don't know anything about the story. So a weird thing that they kept out, which I'm glad they did, is that the town has been overrun for like more than ten years, and there is like multiple ge- generations of children. So it's essentially <laughs> okay. Ch- children creating more children, which is like gross, disgusting. Yeah, not um, a fan of that. Because they all get killed when they turn 19 or 18, I can't remember. Right. So there's like even smaller like babies and stuff involved in this. Very fucked up. Um, okay. The two main leads absolutely hate each other and they're absolutely <laughs> terrible people. You don't even have like Linda Hamilton being like, you know, a nice lady you don't want to see anything bad happen to. And the other dude who's like emotionless but not... He's kind of an asshole, but not the way that, like, apparently he was in the original one. Like, they're just absolutely abhorrent people, so I guess when they die, you don't care. Mm-hmm. Which, also, why wouldn't you want people to care? Um, Great question. There's probably a lot more more things that they kept out, but those are, like, two of the big standout things that kind of was like, yeah, the passage of time is a lot different. Also, that old man with dog didn't exist, because they did just kill mm. all the adults. Right. Which it makes a little more sense because Malachi says, like, oh, we needed his gasoline and stuff. When it's I like, guess. you can just capture that, though. You don't really need <laughs> right. to keep him alive for it. It made more sense for him to be, like, like the harbinger with the couple to be like, oh, yeah, you go this way or that way. Because mm-hmm. then you just have an adult saying that. You know, if you had a right. kid doing that, it would probably be suspicious. Mm-hmm. At least for, such, like, other adults, I would think. Su- such a disturbing idea to, like, have a city of just children and they're like, well, but they're... They kind of already break it by having a harbinger who's just an old man who sits out in the gas and communicates with him. It's like, yeah, all right. They saved well, him for last for some reason. <laughs> right. And then also, know. like, uh, Ma- Malachi kills him also. And then Isaac is like, why? Yeah, Isaac. Maybe I mis- mislabeled Isaac as Malachi. Sorry. Their names are whatever. Isaac is the leader of the cult. Malachi is his bruiser right-hand guy who betrays him. Mm-hmm. So Isaac is the one who is somehow getting telepathically talked to by the supernatural yes. demon. We don't really know how that works. <laughs> but he is mad that he killed that guy. And then he keeps, like, throughout the movie, too, telling him to do things. And Malachi just wants to be in charge so bad that he goes against the monster, even? like. Yeah. It makes no sense when he betrays him other than it's just like he doesn't want to listen to him anymore, I yeah. guess. He there, thinks he'd I mean, be better at it. That's the fundamental flaw of this movie is like a lot of times things just happen. Like it's yeah. very easy to build an arc for Malachi where he starts to think like, I don't know. Like it would how easy would it be for him to say like, I don't think there is a he who walks behind the rose. Yeah. Prove it to me. And then it's like, you don't need proof. You need faith. And then we have like an actual conflict building. Yeah. Instead of he just at some point in a scene, and I wrote it down too, I was like, I guess he's turning on him now. I guess he's turned on his leader. And that's- Yeah, it didn't really make- Yeah, it didn't really make sense. Like, I don't know if it's because the actor is a child or whatever. So like, whenever he would berate him, he looked like kind of sad and down, but not in a way that would make me think, oh, that guy's (laughs) like annoyed. He's going to mutiny. Which, by the way, also, Isaac's actor... (laughs) So, the first time when we watched it this time around, I was like, that kid's a really good child actor. What the hell? And then I later Mm -hmm. learned that, no, he had, like, some sort of growth deficiency, so he was actually, like, 22 years old. So I was like, oh, okay, that's why he's so good, because he's technically not a child actor, but he was very good. (laughs) I had a a big hot take, and this actually affects it. My big hot take about that performance is that kid... The kid who plays Isaac is mm-hmm. objectively the best actor in this movie. Yes. And I think he's miscast. Really? In yeah. which way? I think that the true horror of the children of the corn is that these children are doing this. And hearing that he's an adult man makes me go like, oh, yeah, of course, that's what's going on. Because it just feels like an adult in like a child's body as mm. opposed to like what would be really what would be way more scary to me is if it was like the kid who played Joby played isaac okay. like a little kid who's just like well we got it that he walks behind the rose like juxtaposing the horrific things he's saying and commanding his people to doing mm. with the innocence of a child as opposed to him just being this like operatic hannibal lectory preacher character like he feel like it feels like it's a little closer to what you would expect a psychopathic maniac to be as opposed to the conceit of the movie which is that oh my god we've lost our children well, to I would a think corn maybe- cult 
the time span helps with that. So if it's like if he's been a like zealot preacher man for three years, you know, he'd be pretty used to that sort of role and like mm-hmm. emulating the adults he saw because it's like a very religious town. Like all the town's adults go to church and that, then they go to a cafe and that's what made it so easy to murder him. They were all in one place, most of them anyway. But that, it just, he never felt intimidating to me in a way that like- Yeah, he the, didn't. Especially because he lets them go. In a way that the concept of the children of the corn is so much scarier than this movie articulates it. The idea is so much scarier than this movie ever lets it be. We yeah. never get into it. Yeah, and I think also because one of the first times you, no, second time you see him, when he actually gets a speaking line, it's the first speaking line he gets, because you see him through the window looking creepy and, like, nodding and telling, like, the children through a look, like, yes, now's the time to kill. Yeah, in the first scene in the soda shop, we catch this little, like, oh, there's a upsetting boy in the window. Yeah, just looking. So the first scene where he talks, it's when Malachi brings the future girl, girl who can see the future, was her name Sarah? Sarah, yeah. And, and Joby brings them in and is like, they had music and were drawing things. And Malachi's right. like, oh, she can see the future, that's great. Okay, put them back where they were, I don't care. And then Malachi's <laughs> like, well, we should punish them. And he's like, shut up, don't question me. In his initial scene, he lets these children go and chastises the the more like brutish enforcer one which also makes him less threatening yeah. especially because the brutish enforcer guy like kind of listens to him a bit but like is very petulant about it so i don't know it didn't go it didn't contribute to making him more intimidating that's for sure also i agree <laughs> the opposite in fact roxy what would you say is the big idea of children of the corn here what deep human fear is this movie poking at So we talked about it a bit. We didn't really touch on this too much, but the movie says it enough that it makes me think this is what they wanted it to be about, about how, like, religious zealotism is never a good idea. Like, just unshakable, unwavering, unquestioning faith in a thing is not a way to live your life, and it's how you fall into a trap of following some horrific monster who walks behind the corn, I guess. And... I, I think that's the majority of what they were trying to go for. Uh, there's obviously, you know, a dichotomy with children and adults about some other things about, like, growing up or your children mm-hmm. replacing you or something that could be said. But I don't think it even tried to do any of that, really. Boy, does so it. So that's why I'd go for mostly just the religious zealot angle that they wanted to make a point about that. Actually, you just kind of convinced me that I am even more right <laughs> in my oh. idea. Uh, I'm very smart. <laughs> For me, I was wondering how much of this was, and I don't remember, I don't know the timeline super well, but um, mm-hmm. I know that America in the 80s was going through one of many uh, satanic panics. This idea that oh, okay. our children were playing violent video games or uh, maybe not violent D- video games at this D&D, point. D&D, I but guess. D&D was the, was the big one, yes. And it's like, is Satan corrupting our children? And because you're right, there is a lot of talk about the true nature of religion that Bert gives seemingly out of nowhere. He gives, like, two different speeches, and then a third time, he, well, they talk about it on the radio when, like, the only stations they can get are yes. religious preachers screaming. So, yeah. You're right. The religious preacher is a little off. But, like, Bert, in his, like, when he's talking to the children of the corn and giving them, like, real religion is about love and and values, and you're doing this satanic stuff is not how real religion works. Like, it almost is coming from this pro-religious mindset. Like, our hero character is extolling the virtues of religion while condemning the specifically seemingly satanic values of the children of the corn. And it just was giving me this vibe of, like, the movie is afraid of our children finding some sort of idol that is so contrary to our values that they will metaphorically kill us. So I think it was only in that last speech that I remembered him saying that because like the speech he gives in the church is just about how like religion is bad like he he came across to me as someone who is an atheist i guess Hmm. and it's not until you're mentioning this i think he was just talking about how like any good religion should be about love is what it felt like instead of it being Hmm. like the the goodness of my religion is about love i guess You you might be right you might be right i might have missed the uh the mid speech why does he have two speeches? <laughs> why, can't, um, why can't it all be about him building to <laughs> one big speech? It's ridiculous. Uh, this movie's kind of all over the place in a lot of ways. I guess, like, as a whole, I didn't really like this movie, honestly. Yeah? The way we're talking about it, 
I guess that's just kind of like my <laughs> takeaway at the end. Like I've seen it twice now. I can barely even remember it the first time. And yeah, it's kind of almost more boring than anything else too. Like yeah. you were saying a lot of the concepts and things that are happening, like should be more exciting than the way they are pro- portrayed in this movie. I think I like the concept of the children of the corn. So like a thousand times more than I like yes. the movie children of the corn. Yeah. It's and a great idea. Been... It's not executed on. Yeah. And there's like nine movies like there's sequels to this Mikey like nine of them and I had no idea I didn't realize it had spawned such a giant franchise somehow (laughs) interesting Um, Uh, (laughs) I would love to see them I feel like one of them will probably plant it at some point they gotta get it right (laughs) it's kind of a layup it's kind of a layup of a concept how could they keep getting it wrong uh he asks having watched more movies in the leprechaun franchise than any other (laughs) human being (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Roxy, do you have a question for me? Yes, I do. So, Mikey, if you made a cult, what would it be about? Who mm. is your man who walks behind the rose? Okay, okay, I got one. My okay. cult would absolutely be about writing dogma. Writing dogma, okay. It would be about story structure. All of my children of the corn would be uh, little screenwriters all tickety-type in at story structure, and I would walk through and I would be like, where is... Malachi is your goddess moment. This character must be at the bottom of their hero's journey, and they must make a new discovery here and now. Yes, brother, yes, your character has a want, and they are actively working to achieve it. He who gives notes from the studio does not desire any passive protagonists. That would be my cult. Okay, yeah, no, that sounds uh, very, very effective. (laughs) (laughs) You want to write a big uh, feature-length screenplay, don't you? Yeah, and then there you go. You could actually uh, get some screenplays out of it, too. Then you can shop them around and just keep dominoing it. Get giant movie deals. He who gives notes from the studio has determined that your concept is not commercially viable. (laughs) What would your cult be about? I I love the idea of just referring to people as like, yeah, he who gives notes from the studio, (laughs) he who walks behind the core. (laughs) He he who makes my latte at Cafe Monarca. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> what would your cult be about, Roxy? Should refer to everybody like that. My cult would be about, and it's hard to choose uh, since I have a lot of things I really like, mm. honestly. It would absolutely um, be a fandom, though, right? Possibly. I guess that would probably be the closest because that actually has like an idol or something. Because I was like, hmm, I like desserts a lot. I like horror movies a lot, obviously. Mm. But I'd say the single most thing I'm obsessed with is probably Final Fantasy XIV. So, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> we can, uh,. Worship the producer and his main writer and uh, the masterful musician who does all the soundtracks and everything. We got plenty of religious figures in that, if I make that into a cult. What is the producer's name? Uh, He who invents the cat boys? (laughs) He might be responsible for inventing some of the cat boys. Uh, His name is Yoshi (laughs) P, so I guess he'd be... He, I, I guess just he who is the producer on the gospel? <laughs> I don't know. He, he who is Ishikawa the writer of Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> Ishikawa is the one who uh, made up the Catboys, so she can be uh, she who writes the Catboys or creates the okay. Catboys, I guess. <laughs> Roxy, that's a scary cult. I'm not going to lie to you. I would, uh, I would try to stop you. Okay. Well, your cult's going to take over Hollywood, so I think you're going to be a little too busy to worry about my cult. But you that's can try. That's the thing, Roxy. My cult's already taken over Hollywood. <laughs> he who s- writes the book called Save the Cat <laughs> has told us <laughs> how to write a story and at what page number certain events must occur. <laughs> Roxy, <laughs> on a scale from one to nine, since the number 10 does not exist and will never exist in the scary basement, how likely do you think the events of Children of the Corn are to happen in real life? So I said one out of nine. Ooh. And I said that because children would never be able to pull this much off, even with a <laughs> demon helping them out in the background. I don't think they'd be able to do what to annihilate an entire town like this, especially when you finally get an adult in the mix and he just pushes them over. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I mean, my reasoning for one out of nine. What about you, Mikey? Roxy, you have convinced me I'm going to drop my score a little bit. Oh, really? Because you're right. Kids can't plan. Like, if if it was, like, a <laughs> tactical squad who, like, had mm-hmm. the trust of all these adults, like, but kids aren't planning this big operation. However, I did give it a five. Okay. Because I do believe children are very impressionable. Mm-hmm. And I ask you, 
is there that much of a difference between he who walks behind the rose and Ariana Grande? In terms of uh, influencing children, I'd say there's no difference. In terms of popular figures who we would do anything for. Thank God yeah. Aria Grande only wants us to uh, make out with boys in the summer and not <laughs> murder our parents. And I'm thankful for that every day. <laughs> Roxy, last week we made a bet. Yep. How many times is the word children uttered in the script for the movie Children of the Corn? I said nine. And I said four. You're not going to believe this. The answer is one. What? That's insane. Just, how 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 was there only one? Just one time somebody said, uh, look at all these children or something like that. <laughs> we got to fight even, through these children. Yeah. Damn, I'm really surprised by that, actually. So I guess I win by default this time. You win. You win. I thought for sure there would be a moment where they walk in and they go, these children are of the corn. Especially because the adults don't know a lot of these kids' names. So you would think they would <laughs> say, like... The word child or children more often, I guess. Hey, you, child, go get your children, friends, and get out of here. <laughs> Roxy, that's going to bring our total bet score to Roxy with 27, Mikey with 22, Ty with 2. And remember, something happens at 30. 37. Okay, Mikey, this is three episodes. Better step up your game, please. We don't, don't know what I'm happens. I'm going to do a training montage of guessing uh, bizarre things about horror movies. <laughs> I'm going to try and do just better. Just marathon like a ton more horror movies. Just have multiple marathons back to back to back. 24 hour marathons. And uh, hopefully all of the writing tropes will give you power to guess these things. <laughs> hey, that's the hope. All right, Roxy, it's time we open the interview tomb. Inside will be a relevant interviewee whose only hope to escape the scary basement is to be interviewed by us. Let's see who's in the tomb tonight. Ah, hello. Where am I? Am I safe? Y yes. Hi. Hello. You're in the scary basement. Do you have anything to do with the movie Children of the Corn? Oh, okay. This is an interview tomb sort of thing. Whew. Okay. Yes, my name is George Goldsmith. I wrote the Children of the Corn screenplay with Stephen King. Oh, wow. What was it like working with Stephen King to adapt his short story for the big screen? Oh, Stephen was great. Although, with anyone, if you work on a property that isn't your own, you know, you want to bring a little of yourself into the story. And sometimes you get shut down. Uh, what did you try to add? Well, my first draft had a twist at the end. I revealed that... All along, the children of the corn were adults. Oh, so at the end of Children of the Corn, all the children were just going to say, surprise, we're adults? Yes! How is that a twist? We'd set it up, you see, all throughout the movie. For instance, there would have been a scene where supposed child Malachi would ask real adult Bert, to buy him beer outside 7-Eleven. But why would Malachi do that? If he was actually an adult, he could just buy beer himself? It would have been a manipulation. Who are they manipulating? And why? It doesn't matter. What matters is, at the end of the movie, after the cornfield is burned, a bunch of out-of-towners would come back to the town and they'd say, Oh, wow, the heroes of the movie didn't know the children of the corn were actually adults. But I don't judge them for it. They can still be smart and good people, even if they were tricked into thinking a child was an adult. Wouldn't all the children of the corn just be adult height then? I mean, they can't, like, pull off a mask and then be taller. Don't get hung up on the details. It's important to show audiences that normal people, even a smart young doctor, can be manipulated into thinking an adult is a child. You know, George, this seems like it's really affecting you. What's really going on here? In high school, I had a best friend. A girl. Josie. She was cool, like, without even trying. Was instantly the most popular girl in school. But then, my class learned that Josie was a journalist. Oh, no. A journalist? Yeah. She was undercover, writing a story about what high school was really like these days. Also, it was kind of like she was getting a do-over on her own high school experience, where she was a huge science club geek that everyone called a Josie Grossie because no one liked her. 
And you somehow never knew she was an adult. No, don't you see? It's easy to be manipulated into thinking a child is an adult. It can happen to anyone! You don't have to be a stupid nincompoop to be tricked into thinking an adult is a child. Hey man, I get it. This is clearly a touchy subject for you. Just to get back to the interview, uh, how, how would this twist have changed the movie? There would have been more scenes of Isaac and Malachi going to work. They were going to be mid-level brokers at a small stock exchange. Literally nothing else would have been different. I know we're trying to appease you here, but that literally wouldn't work with the town they're in. Well, see, I had a short run as a stockbroker myself, and I got fired. They said I was a nincompoop. George, you gotta stop putting yourself into your screenplays, buddy. You know, you sound exactly like Stephen King right now. All right, close the interview tomb. This guy... We get it. He's uh, he's up in his feels. Yeah, I don't think we need to hear any more out of him. <laughs> All right. Roxy. Mikey? We get rid of one pile of trash, and then another pile of trash comes right over. Here he comes, the demon bomb. That was meaner than Whoa. I meant to be about both of Espe these. <laughs> Especially <laughs> because you called him friend last time. <laughs> During the intro, so uh, that's got to be whiplash you, emotionally can, can for Can you tell too. that talking about this Children of the Corn movie put me in a bad mood? You're right. Yeah. I was like so excited to see my buddy the demon bot, and then I had to talk about this fucking movie where uh, characters just do things for no reason. And all of a sudden, the demon bot is a pile of trash to me. I'm sorry, demon bot. It's not your fault that Children of the Corn was so bad. Is it he who walks behind the rose back here having his influence on you, Mikey? He's probably down here somewhere. You may call me he who forces you to watch movies. Mikey and Roxy, for next week you must watch the 2022 film Prey, the new prequel film in the Predator franchise. Okay, Prey. This is a Predator movie, despite the title being Prey. So Very good title for a Predator movie. Really, I, uh, I have uh, only really liked the first Predator movie, so this is going to be interesting to see how I feel about this one. But yeah. uh, I'm prepared to... To love it or not, I guess I'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's make a bet for next week. What do you say? Yeah, okay, let's make a bet. So how about does the third build actor survive according to IMDb? Okay, yes. I will say yes, the third build actor is gonna make it through and they're gonna and they're gonna live a happy, prosperous life after beating the predator up. Okay, then I am gonna say no. They're going to not live a happy, prosperous life after beating up the predator. You think Sadly. they're going to get eaten or sliced by the predator? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll find out. Wait, does That's the one of my it's least favorite ways to die predator's is eat. by the predator. Do is we it ever people? see predator's eat? I don't think we ever see them eat, do we? <laughs> Just smash to a predator like at a <laughs> an Italian <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> I've always wondered, did any of the predator movies show their home world? Like, what is their entire civilization like? Because you're just seeing the outlying, like, hunter weirdos who literally travel to different planets. Those could just be, like... The weirdo gun-toting hillbillies, right. for all we know. They're the rednecks. Uh, yeah, they could be, yeah. <laughs> we actually don't know. They've got a rich artistic society where they make music and art and who knows what, Mikey. Roxy, the idea that your society would be represented by the worst amongst you, say a hunter, predator, instead of an artistic aristocrat, is very <laughs> scary. Why are they what do you say? Though? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, there's still a class gap in the predator culture. <laughs> it could be. Who knows? I'm sure there's deep lore somewhere that someone will correct us on at some point if they actually care. All that is to say, we got to end not talking about that, but instead talking about what's making us happy. What's giving you the smileys this week? Uh, so the thing that's giving me the smileys, as you put it this week, is uh, a YouTuber who is actually someone I've been watching for literally years. I can't believe I haven't mentioned him before. Oh. But his name is John Wolf. He previously mm -hmm. went by Harshly Critical. So his YouTube channel, if you're searching for the URL, it will still be Harshly Critical is one word. But you'll find him mm. if you search his name, too. He has been covering, like, horror movies for... God, maybe, I want to say a decade at this point, maybe maybe more like eight years. I don't know, a very long time. He's very good mm. at it. He's very fun to watch. He covers like tiny, small, weird indie games as well as bigger games. And more recently, he did like full playthroughs of Bloodborne and Elden Ring, which was a little different. He has a lot of competitive Dead by Daylight as well. I say competitive, maybe that's not correct, actually. 
He does a lot of streaming for Dead by Daylight. I'm sure he could do it competitively, but I don't mm -hmm. think he does. <laughs> but he's just in it for the fun. He's yeah, a for the time. most part. Yeah, and he's been, like, without fail, very reliable uploads and everything. And recently, like this past week or maybe two weeks ago, he was just like, you know what? I've literally never taken a break in, like, ten years. Um, so I'm going to take a little break. And I'm going to be right back. And he's usually always really upfront, too, about, like, the way... YouTube's analytics and internet analytics will kind of, like, affect his channel or something in terms of, like, the stuff he puts out. So, like, he tried to make a separate Dead by Daylight channel and then was, like, up front with people about, like, yeah, I wanted to give it, like, a year or so and, like, see how that went and then see if I was going to keep doing that or move this stuff to my other channel or what. Mm -hmm. uh, so he he's very, like, honest about those sorts of things and gives you, like, a good head up, heads up about, like, why he would be making a choice. He also does a lot of charity streams as well and has been able to raise huge amounts of money just by, like, playing you know, other horror games that he's played before. I think one of the more early ones I can remember was, uh, like, Amnesia was one of the first ones that he redid for charity. And, like, I think they were able to make, like, maybe five or ten grand. And that was, like, I don't know, back in huh? 2015. So at this point, I think his most recent one made, like, around 25k or maybe even more in, like, huh? a single stream, which is, like, very impressive. And also, he's adjacent to us making horror content, which is just mm -hmm. nice to see someone uh, succeeding on their own like that, too. Um, but I'd, cool. I'd highly recommend him to you, Mikey, and to other folks out there if you like gaming sounds like you got a Sounds like you got a little horror friend that you're yeah. watching. Aww. Yeah. What about you, Mikey? What's you. making you happy? I am re-watching The Sopranos. And Roxy... Oh. It's just the best and funniest show. It's the funniest show I've ever seen. It's so, so funny. Um, he's been a... quoting it a lot, guys. You haven't seen that. It's off the podcast, but Mikey <laughs> is very good at remembering lines from The Sopranos and quoting them. <laughs> I get into a, a thing where I just start, like, I watch a show enough that I start, yeah. like, mimicking <laughs> the characters' like <laughs> affectations. And uh, there's a character named uh, Polly, who's one of Tony's uh, doing, lieutenants. Doing. And he, he always, like, it looks like he's making, like, the the rock and roll horns, but he's uh -huh. just, like, loosely taking them and pointing at people. He's like, hey, Tone, you know Ralphie's got that tip on the safe cracking job from one of our guys. He's not kicking upstairs to you. Ah, but Ro. <laughs> he's so it's funny. It's like he's pointing, but has his pinky finger out, too, which is like, yeah. are, are you raising it to be, like, a fancy aristocrat? <laughs> <laughs> or what? <laughs> what is the purpose? It just makes it more emphatic, I guess. Um, there's there's this really beautiful like rhythm to this show. Tony's like talking about uh his daughter is in college and he's just like angry about some like mob thing that's bothering him, and it's uh -huh. just like, well, Meadow wants to drop out and go to Europe. And Tony's just like at the fridge and he's just like, I knew all that harping on art was gonna lead to trouble. <laughs> What's this beef with art? It's so funny. It's so good. It's the best show. I, you don't need my recommendation to watch one of universally decided greatest TV shows of all time. But that is absolutely what's making me happy. My girlfriend is so sick of me doing Polly Walnut's impressions. <laughs> so does that mean you're going to continue doing it? Uh, even more so than before. I can't stop. It's just like a Pavlovian response. I, I'm not even realizing that I'm doing it. I'm pointing <laughs> with my two fingers right now. <laughs> yeah, he I sure is. Stop. I can verify it 110%. That's what's happening right now in the video. <laughs> it's a good show. Roxy, it's time now for Haunted Plugs. Hey, Tone, where can people find you on the internet? <laughs> Um, I'm on Twitter at Roxy Polk, and I'm also on Twitch at Roxy Polk. I, too, am on Twitter and Twitch at Mikey McCaller. Also, make sure to give us five stars. Uh, five scary stars. Or leave a review. And remember to share. And scare. The podcast with your friends. Finally, as always, make sure you do not sign any contracts offered to you by Demon Robots. Goodbye. Goodbye.